Hello there and welcome to the Second Life Book Club. My name is Drexler Dupre. I have two amazing guests visiting today, Paul McCauley and Christopher Brown, and I will introduce them in just a minute after a few housekeeping notes. Welcome to Book Club Island. Book Club Island is open 24-7, as you know, as everything is in Second Life. We meet here every Wednesday, usually at 12 o'clock, uh, unless we have visitors from uh, another time zone. We meet here with readers, writers, sometimes publishers, editors, people who cherish their written word. And this is very important to me. We do not discriminate against lapsed readers. OK, so if the last novel you read was assigned to you back in high school, we you, you can still come in, come in and we will embrace you and we'll, we'll find a book for you. Since we're listed in the destination guide on the featured events, you may bump into a well-meaning noob. Be kind, befriend them, recommend some books. Also join the group, suggest a show idea by sending me an email or an IM. We're booked solid through April 2021, but you can always suggest authors and I shall pursue them, hunt them down, lure them into Second Life. We have a reading list at bookshop.org every week. That's bookshop.org slash shop slash Draxter Reads. But you can click on any of the books that are lying around here and that will shoot you to the, um, to the, to the uh, reading list. Uh, of the current show. Big thanks to our team, Strawberry Linden, camera streaming, Brett Linden helps out with security, marketing patch Linden, whole governance team, the moles, Marianne McCann customized the venue, Kralos dresses up all these custom avatars. Big thanks to Silas Merlin, he makes custom uh, merch and also super custom avatars. As a matter of fact, the statue that is sitting right next to me, the Dragon Drax, this reading is also made by Silas. AJ McDowell makes some merch, including the coffee cups. We have a partnership with Slink, fine makers of fine SL skins. So all the guests from now on, they have Slink bodies. Now, um, today we have two guests. Uh, as you can tell, I'm experimenting with formats. We had panels, we had individual conversations. Today, we have two, and maybe they'll talk to each other <laughs> across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and I can just sort of sit back and, uh, and listen to them. To my right is Paul McCauley, author of many, many, many books. Uh, I don't know if she sh if I can uh, classify them all as hard sci-fi, we'll ask him. Multi-award winning uh, British author. You find a lot of his books here on the table. His debut novel, 400 Billion Stars, came out in 1988. And after Peter Watts, he's our second guest who switched from being a biologist to writer. Uh, his books, I read two of them in, in preparation. I'm reading on a schedule. I would have loved to read more. I actually bought 10 books, put them in the shelf. They deal with biotech, a little bit of uh, AI. The latest book is War of the Maps. And uh, War of the Maps is absolutely fascinating. Follows a so-called Lucidor who is in pursuit of a master criminal in a in a weird world somewhere. Uh, in a star system that we don't know about, possibly created by AI, people who live there, they talk uh, about them uh, under the name of godlings. The Lucidor encounters genetically manipulated creatures, some ens enslaved to keep the economy humming, some free to philosophize. There are competing political systems. A lot of stuff thrown in there in 450 pages. It's unfolding in a pace that is masterful. Welcome, Paul. Uh, I dis I, I'm just discovering you now. Uh, I'm ashamed to admit, but uh, I love it. How are you doing here in your avatar embodiment? What is your avatar embodiment about? Well, let's explain. The avatar um, is is a character called Unlikely Worlds, which is also my um, Twitter handle, if you want to find me on Twitter. And uh, basically, Unlikely Worlds is a kind of... Um, story hunting alien uh, who may or may not be a fish or a bunch of shrimp in a tank uh, nobody it cer certainly is in a motile tank which is a basically a, a space suit uh, but nobody knows quite what's inside and in, uh, in so, what in what book does the does the so character that's, it, that's in a cup it's in a couple of books uh one's called something coming through and the other one's called into everywhere which is oh about, awesome kind of there's something alien, coming through actually i tank. bought and it's on the table right here yeah, yeah, that's in my shelf. Yeah, cool. That's coming next. Uh, do you think the uh, War of the Maps is a fair characterization? And I want you to uh, lead into War of the Maps 
in a little bit when we do the reading but uh, how would you how would you pitch it or how actually did you pitch it before you wrote it uh well the thing with pitching is that i i always tend to stray away from the pitch when i actually get down to writing the book so uh let's ah. forget the pitch but let's forget the pitch that i use the pitch that i suppose i could use now i finish the book is perhaps something like it's a very far future weird world but it's also basically a western it's it's kind yes, of like a 1970s exactly. revenge western you know like one of clint eastwood's later um grimmer movies that's exactly uh, so, how it reads yeah. yes that's Except that is the, yeah. yeah go ahead yeah the character carries a big stick rather than a gun but uh he has the same kind of mindset and uh, it kind of, it's kind of an examination as well about uh, of the hero myth and a kind of critical uh, go at it as well because the hero myth is far too common in science fiction and fantasy i think yeah do i understand you correctly that you kind of snuck this one in that you pitch something then you get a green light and then you write something else and then uh the powers that be uh they uh they buy it nonetheless Oh, my, my publisher is very patient. Um, no, it's, it's sort of like the book that I, I, I said I'd write, but it, it, it doesn't end in the same way. They never do. Um, and he, uh, at the end, he said, well, when, when do they go to Mars and have a real war? And I was like, well, I didn't decide I didn't need to do that. Um, because so, it's uh, exactly like the Western in its subtlety, too. I mean, you, you just don't you don't uh, buy into these these tropes. I mean, you kind of avoid them. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, tropes. The tropes are very well used, but you can always find, uh, uh, if you look carefully, a new angle or a new use for them. I hope you can anyway, because trope, you know, genre-based fiction tropes are what we deal in, right. and uh, it's very rare for a brand new trope to come along. I mean, I'm trying to think what the last brand new trope in science fiction was. Uh, going all the way back to uh, Neuromancer, probably, and uh, cyberspace. Um, that presumably there are some other tropes, but not ones that have taken off and become common usage the way that cyberspace and virtual reality have. Um, so, and that, you know, uh, Neuromancer came out in what, 84? Uh, 82, 84? I think. Yep. Or 84. Or, hmm? 84. 84, no, an ominous year. Um, and, um, here we are, you know, uh, almost 40 years later, thinking, what's new in science fiction? I mean, obviously, uh, the tools are being are being used for new purposes now and, and used for uh, questioning identity and looking at multiplicity of identities. And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, much more, uh, like Chris's stuff, near future science fiction that's uh, questioning asking deep questions about where we're going and a lot of climate change fiction which i've committed as well that's what i was uh, with, which asks yeah. deep questions about what have we done and how can we fix it and if we can't fix it what's going to happen no, um I so we're using those tools to ask to to try and answer and to try and interrogate new questions uh so this is this is this is quite fascinating i want to pick this up later uh i never thought about it uh, as as a reader that in fact uh yeah, we we were thirty years uh, after uh, the last the last big sort of trope has been invented, and I'm glad that let's bring uh, in Christopher Brown because I'm glad I can contrast a science fiction writer with a documentarian, Chris, <laughs> with <laughs> with your current uh, trilogy, uh, Tropic of Kansas, Rule of Capture, and Failed State. I mean, this is so close to the real world. Uh, we see uh, nefarious uh, government uh, forces rounding up people in Portland, now uh, New York, and uh, government agencies where nobody knows uh, what they are. They have they have new names. We in your book, um, in your Tropic of Kansas uh, world that you create there, it's a brutal, oppressive, dictatorial regime in America, and. Uh, there is a process, uh, a denaturalization process, actually, in effect. The law has been passed that if you protest, that's how I understood it, you can um, run the risk of getting uh, locked up and then denaturalized. You lose your citizenship, but because nobody wants you, you're still in the U.S., but then you're basically in a prison and uh, you'll do a... Uh, 
nice prison labor for the rest of your life. But but uh, be before we go there, I want to properly introduce you. You're, uh, you live in Texas. You you come from the, the the legal realm. You've been a I don't know if you still are a practicing lawyer. You've been nominated for uh, the World Fantasy Award for a um, a contribution to the to a, a book called Three Messages and a Warning: Contemporary Mexican Short Stories of the Fantastic. The book is also here on the table. I have it on order, but it's uh, it's back ordered here in Germany. And um, yeah, in, in the last three to four years, you 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 turned out these uh, Tropic of Kansas books. Um, what uh, do you say, uh, Christopher, uh, chronicling this sort of five minute into the future thing? And yeah. it seems you're overtaken yeah. by what's actually happening. That's a funny thing, Drax. I mean, I was actively trying with Tropic of Kansas, which was the first of these books, uh, after having, you know, mostly been a writer of short fiction and, and as you know, an editor of some anthology work, um, trying to write a story about a I don't know, when I started it, Tropic of Kansas, it was when all of these revolutions were going on across the Arab world and elsewhere. And uh, and I sort of, my counterfactual was to imagine what if something like that was going on in the United States. And Almost uh, like an update, it can't happen here, which I highly recommend, yeah. by the way. That's a must read for everyone, Sinclair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and um, you know, a kind of a post 9-11 novel set in a world where 9-11 never happened, but all of the... Uh, dark energy of that period was kind of directed domestically mm. and um and so and i and the, the the tropic of kansas of the title is this uh kind of mirror version of the american heartland that i see when i drive around the country of a kind of a, a economically and ecologically exhausted space uh that has a kind of a post-apocalyptic or an apocalyptic vibe to it, even in the right now, at least from a, a, a naturalist point of view. And so I, uh, yeah, so you I mean, ended you up mean that, to... I'm sorry to step on you. You mean that in terms of uh, sort of the monoculture and all that, because that's another big thing. Actually, we're going to get into it later. Paul's Austral is also uh, touching on that, the the destruction of the planet through, through this excessive uh, uh, monoculture uh, business. Absolutely. And that's really the driver of the newest book, Failed State, which is trying to kind of write a write its way into a more utopian vision of like how do you how do you crack the nut of uh uh hacking the fundamental um you know bad bargain with Demeter at the root of all civilization, which is around these grain monocultures that decimate the landscape and that ultimately are the generators of all of our like economic in inequalities and most of our injustices. So, but anyway, I started playing with things like, oh, well, there's always this talk about what if you had a CEO uh, elected president? Wouldn't, wouldn't running a co yeah. company be the best qualification to run a country? And so I was like, well, I've worked in corporate life. I know that uh, corporations are not democracies, they're dictatorships. So what would that be like? So that was kind of the the sort of, you know, off the cuff premise of Tropic of Kansas. And, uh, and when I finished it, I was like, oh, this is so implausible. No one will ever buy this, this idea of a charismatic CEO who becomes a fascist president. And then by the, you know, within, I don't know, a, a year after finishing it, I was like, oh, I better sell this before reality catches up with me. But um, <laughs> this but is I funny because now we do have a CEO, but it, the only thing he's not charismatic. Uh, that's the difference between your character, the president, in, in your book, and the real world. So it's not yeah, really well, a total. He's, he's, okay. he's charismatic to some, apparently, but um, <laughs> but yeah, I don't know, Drax. I mean, fundamentally, I think dystopia or any kind of speculative fiction done right is drawing from the material of the observed world. It's a kind of a weird uh, black mirror variant of realism, and if you do yeah. it right. You know, the thing is you do, you're going to look prescient just for accurately describing what really was the present or the imminent present, as it were, when you were writing the book. I mean, I plowed through these books. It's, it's really awesome. A little bit later, we get into, uh, you know, also the, the legal aspect of it. Um, as people know, I've been married to a lawyer uh, for 19 years now. And my joke is I'm always on trial uh, every morning when I uh, don't do the dishes. But but uh, 
the the way you incorporate this, uh, you know, in, in, there's there's a big legal case also in um, uh, rule of capture, which which is really cool. And I usually don't read in that genre. I don't even know if you would classify it as a uh, within the legal thriller genre. Before we get to a reading, just real quick back to Paul because this is something that I I ask everyone. Paul, your take on uh, dystopia uh, versus ut utopia fiction. Do you feel that dystopian fiction, if we, I guess, overconsume it in whatever form, book or, or film, can that be, can that lead to apathy rather than actually uh, activate people to, to actively want to change stuff? Mm, how how do you question. come down on that? Um, well, there's, I mean, there's two kinds of dystopian fiction, I suppose. There, there are like awful warnings, um, which may set out possible solutions to to the troubles they uh, they uh, um, deal with. Uh, but then there's sort of wallpaper dystopias, um, which we find in movies, where, where where the dystopian look is is just used as a, a kind of background for sort of mm. uh, noirish stuff that goes on um so there's two kinds and yeah we can get used to the second kind i suppose yeah but um what's happening um in america at the moment is is, is very dystopian but it's also energizing people to push back against it if yeah. you look at what's happening in portland which is basically um i was i was rereading um rule of cat um just this week um, just to remind myself how good it was. And it was like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm getting confused here between uh, the book is bleeding into reality or rea reality is bleeding into the book. But yeah. the, the thing is that um, uh, dystopian uh, situations can energize you. The problem with utopias, of course, is that they're impossible places. I mean, they're named for, um, you know, news for nowhere and uh, from nowhere and so on. They're named for places that you can't actually reach, but that maybe you can aspire to the condition of utopia. Um, but, um, but isn't it also a good exercise? I mean, without imagine, without imagining anything, I mean, we, we can't get anywhere. I mean, imagination with the lack thereof is, I mean, in my mind, that's really the culprit here. Look, you know, even economically, we always say, well, we can't change it as if the economy were a natural law. Uh, you, you, have, yeah. you, have, you have to have a vision of you have to have a vision of a better future to to get there, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, and that's something that yeah. kind of disappeared from our discourse and even from a lot of science fiction. But, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the base assumption of all science fiction is that wherever you find yourself, the economic um, rule is going to be the uh, rule of capitalism, and the uh, uh, um, uh, use of use of labor by other other people to make profit. I mean, basically, that's what it is. There's a, there's a tiny argument about that in, in Austral, where which is basically that um, it doesn't matter what other system you use um, because you can you spend all your time arguing about what the system is, and meanwhile, the capitalists sneaky get on with what they're doing and and mm -hmm. capture the ground that you were you were trying to you you were arguing over. Uh, which comes kind of comes from experience in the 1980s of dealing with uh, de of, of being actually not dealing with being part of the kind of left in Britain. Now I'm now I'm not to be considered as as a, as a rotten uh, centrist um, because of uh, the overturned windows moved somewhat um, in in my lifetime. Uh, but um, the, the problem with dystopias is 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 basically getting dystopias is there's too much talk and not, not enough action. Mm. Um, I really, I really love uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars books, but there's a long section in Green Mars, um, which is about the Constitution. It goes on for like 200 pages, and I'm like, can I skip this, please? Except I couldn't. I was reviewing it, and I understood why it was there, but um, it, it just encapsulated the, the problem. Of all dystopias is that you have to just that they're basically uh, utopias tend to be like guides to Tomorrowland, you know, here's the, here's the uh, steam crash and here's the automated airship factory and all the rest of it. Whereas dystopias are like guides to how we get the washing up done. And slight, I've had slight experience of communes and uh, the problem, it, they always come down to the washing up problem. You know, who does the washing up? And it's Actually, like who ate the yogurt political... in the fridge well, that was mine, and I put a sticker on it that I was mine. Yeah, that was my commune the problem. Shared off, there's, 
Yeah, there's that too as well, of course. But uh, the, the 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 washing up problem is 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 a good one because the answer is always wrong. Whoever whoever does it, so nobody does the washing up. Uh, I and would there's like your dystopia. To... <laughs> Piles yeah. of washing up everywhere where people argue about uh, systemic problems of whatever. I apologize for stepping on folks. We have we have always these tiny little delays. That's uh, I uh, apologize. It's not good hosting uh, of me. Uh, I will send you a five Linden dollar a reimbursement <laughs> charge for every time I step on people. But uh, great points, Paul. I I tend to agree uh, also, especially on sort of the glossy way uh, dystopian can be depicted uh, in in films. And it's interesting that the gritty stuff of uh, of the 70s really holds up. I mean, we have uh, mm -hmm. Daniel Krause coming on. He wrote a book uh, based on George Romero with with uh, uh, permission from the estate, actually. And we'll be talking about those original uh, Night of the Living Dead and Dawn of the Dead films. But I completely digress because I would like Chris to to head up uh, here on uh, the front of the stage, please. There is failed state. And Chris, please do set up. Uh, you're reading. I haven't read the book uh, in a uh, interesting capitalist uh, twist. The <laughs> even the author, I think, does not have the paper book yet uh, ready. Um, it's when, when, is, when is it coming out? It's coming out three weeks from yesterday, and ah. uh, oh, I've just stepped past the podium. It's coming out three weeks from yesterday, and yeah, this summer because of the pandemic, um, I'm gonna have to walk back around, I guess. The, um... Hold on, Chris. We can actually stand down. Hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna put the bookshelf uh, book uh, the books down. Oh no no, you can walk up. Yeah, fine. I, the, I have uh, the powers. Mm -hmm. All review copies this year, at least for my publisher Harper Collins, and I think for most of the others, are digital, exclusively digital. So, mm -hmm. um, and here I go again. Sorry, <laughs> is me. All right, you're right. I'll just go. I'll just go over here. Wherever you are, I'm going to bring the book stand to you. Here you are. Uh, stand right there, and I'll bring the book stand. See, this is the magic of Second Life. Uh, I'll back me... up a little. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> no, no. Stay right there. Hold on. And I'll Stop. bring, the, I'll bring the book stand to you. Just give me a second here. And you, you did, you did say that failed state is. Uh, is an attempt at a utopian uh, wrapping up of the Tropic of Kansas world, or is the, is that how you would classify it? It's a little yeah, bit that's of a, right. I mean, so, so because I, I want to say Tropic of Kansas really is somewhat open ended, and then it, um, I mean, it's pretty bleak. I mean, these maximum security prisons and sort of a, a Guantanamo type prison on the in the continental U.S. and and it's it's just it's just really bleak uh, what I read prior to uh, uh, it, it, it addresses the point you were just discussing with Paul, which is sort of about how do you have a how do you take to make it there's of uh, the world that we've made. And I think dystopian fiction done well can kind of put a funhouse mirror or a dark mirror up to the world in a way that will help you not take for granted the dystopian things in the real world. And so part of the point of Tropic of Kansas is to do that, to take the tropes of more like adventure fiction and use them to um, uh, show the experience of the society from the people who live outside of privilege and power. Mm -hmm. uh, Rule of Capture and this book, Failed State, both uh, taken in a different direction, uh, a kind of a mashup of the legal thriller uh, and um, uh, the dystopian novel that I pitched as Better Call Saul meets 1984, um, and uh, without much more of an idea than that. But fundamentally, uh, Rule of Capture, which takes place before the events of Tropic of Kansas, but each book is a standalone, uh, it explores the possibility of achieving change in a dystopian society through the figure of a kind of very 70s kind of figure, the sort of underground lawyer 
uh, who is uh, defending political dissidents in a U.S. that's gone nuts in a country where the rule of law has been suspended. Failed state, which I'll read from right now, uh, imagines what comes after the revolution in Tropic of Kansas when our divisions produce a kind of a bona fide, you know, almost second civil war and the president is deposed and uh, and uh, we have an opportunity on the one hand for people to take their autonomous communities and try to build a, an authentically better future uh, and other people who are trying to take advantage of the chaos uh, for their own sort of financial benefit. So let me just read briefly uh, from the beginning of that. This is Failed State, which is coming out on August 11th from Harper Voyager. The failure of the American legal system turned out to be good for the lawyers. It was not so good for the clients, but in those first few years after the uprising, everybody had to adapt. For Donnie Kimo, the hardest thing about adapting was that he had to spend a lot of time in Dallas. That he had grown up there only made it worse, but it was where what passed for justice in those days could be found, far enough from the disappearing coasts that they, they had to they only had to close the courthouses during tornado season. As a bonus, Dallas still had real food if you could afford it. And the air conditioning still worked, which was more than you could say for most cities in those days, when the infrastructure that hadn't been destroyed in the fighting or died of old age and inattention was often out of juice or saved for when it was really needed. Half the people Donnie knew back home in Houston and all the ones with money it bailed for Big D over the past decade, the same way they'd vacated New Orleans as it drowned. And so Dallas was still rich, or at least good at making you think so, by keeping things as shiny as it could with available materials, as shiny as the waxed BMWs and Benzes you could still find proud corporate execs driving down the increasingly empty freeways, usually with armed chauffeurs who were also the ones they paid to wait in the gas lines. Those execs were the ones Donnie came to hunt. Them and their investors, assets, and insurance policies, and whatever else they had managed to hold on to through the years of dictatorship, blight, and civil strife that burned up the hard-earned savings of most. Donnie did not have a BMW, a Benz, or even a Chevy. He did have a locked file drawer crammed full of jewelry and expensive watches he had accepted as payment in lieu of fees from the political dissidents he had represented during the long emergency. The contents of that drawer could be enough to retire on if the economy ever recovered enough for people to afford such luxuries again, or to really care what time it was in an America where the idea of the future was a form of nostalgia rarely discussed outside of corner bars and neighborhood marijuana dispensaries, and where most people, including Donnie, were focused on settling the scores of the past. The judges still cared what time it was, but there were not enough Rolexes in the world to correct Donnie Kimo's knack for showing up late, even when his own future was on the line. I'll stop there, Drax. That's just a good little sort of teaser from the opening. That's awesome. It's an awesome tone. Uh, Donnie Kimo is the lawyer, uh, public defender, and wh what I what I love about this character, he is uh, well. He's also uh, has a drug problem. I mean, that's one of he the... He does. He does. He likes to, uh, uh, yeah, I was deal just with his... Say, I love this character because he's a drug addict like myself. No, that's not what I meant. Uh, he is struggling also to to find his conscience, it, it, feel, it feels to me, in the very beginning. I mean, it's it's he's kind of phoning it in, I guess, a little bit, right? And then he... Uh, finds his conscience and then he fights for these so-called terrorists that are um, tortured and and just um, treated uh, with exceptional brutality. You have a uh, John Woo uh, type uh, character in there. Uh, people can Google the name John Y O O, the architect of the uh, the tor the torture memo. Uh, wrote the torture memos of the Bush Bush administration. I mean, you have it in the uh, in the previous book. I don't know if he makes a reappearance here. He is the uh, the White House. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, and it's yeah, the character is is a he's a kind of classic burned out case, and um, he's conflicted. I mean, he's a lawyer who has the problem of seeing all of these kinds of moral ambiguities in what are really pretty black and white situations, and 
has to have his, um, as is true of a lot of characters existing within a dystopian environment, has to has his, have has his, have his conscience kind of fully awakened by the circumstances of his clients or of the challenges he's faced with. And and I think that idea of like reinvigorating the idea of that uh, kind of champion of the underdog, of the person who uses whatever kind of special skills they have, whether it's as a lawyer or as a scientist or otherwise, to kind of interrogate power and to, uh, uh, you know, kind of champion uh, the possibility of some better future or at least some little amount of change is uh, is a kind of a fun thing to take on and uh, uh, and a fun narrative challenge to take on. It also makes for a great story, especially if you try to ground it in the real. I like I'm wondering story. as we're as I'm uh, changing the book uh, for for Paul to read from War of the Maps. Uh, yes, thank you, Chris. You can now uh, go back to your seat. Um, I love I love doing these shows where I can tell uh, very accomplished uh, literary uh, figures to go back to their seat. Uh, that's the power structure that uh, that I love here in Second Life. If you're just tuning in, this is the Second Life Book Club every Wednesday, 12 o'clock. We have Paul McAuley here and Christopher Brown, uh, both uh, very accomplished writers. I don't know if I would call Chris uh, relatively new on the on the scene because we're going to be talking about his um, anthologies and there's a bunch of books that I found. I don't know when they came out. There's even a poetry collection that has to do uh, with uh, in the description and suggests that it has to do with the disability. Um, every Wednesday, 12 o'clock here at the Second Life Book Club. And now uh, as um, Paul, please come uh, to the front of the stage as I'm setting up War of the Maps. Just real quick, Chris, do you agree with the sentiment that that Paul suggested in dystopia in movies um, that that, uh, I don't know, the, the glossiness or just sort of the packing together all these sort of, um, I don't know, tropes and explosions or whatnot, that that uh, in that medium, in the medium of film uh can can lead to uh, apathy, maybe oh, more so than with books. Going for a walk. Um, I'm, I'm having problems multitasking here, Derek. So um, I've accidentally gone for a walk like Christy. Um, I, th I thought I was in control there, but clearly not. Um, the problem is so that, that was actually a question is... for Chris to give you time oh, to, right. walk well, to look at the scenery. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah well, so uh, go, ahead speak, and please, go ahead, Chris. Chris. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, well, there's no question that uh, a lot of dystopian cinema provides a form of fantasy, uh, especially there's a certain type of dystopian scenario that uh, the English critic Brian Aldous called the cozy catastrophe, which is like all of these stories where the world has ended, but there's sort of this one person, and it's usually a guy, usually a white guy who's sort of Roaming the wasteland, uh, kind of like in all of the, uh, oh, like that movie, The Omega Man with Charlton Heston is sort of a seminal example. But it's also true of the Mad Max films. Uh, yeah. you know, somebody's kind of roaming the wasteland. And well, on the one hand, it should seem awful, in the sense that there's like a secret fantasy there, a fantasy of like the opportunity to, to exercise total dominion over the entirety of, uh, of the world. Uh, that I think is, you know, it's it's pretty problematic, a little creepy, pretty pretty dark when you think about it. But I think that it, a lot of the, a lot of the dystopian cinemas uh, doesn't hold up to much kind of political scrutiny, if you will. Yeah. If you kind of look at what's really going on there. Um, it actually uh, bugged I, me about uh, Ready Player One and people embracing the film. I thought the book was fine. I mean, it's a it's a it's a great read, but uh, I I actually think the film is somewhat problematic. I want to do a special show on the film. That's gonna probably uh, hundreds of people will unfriend me immediately when I set out my initial thesis on the film. <laughs> but uh, I I find Ready Player One not 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 a scenario. That, I, I don't want to get off a tangent. Paul is ready to read. We we could discuss this in the oh. off. Uh, yeah, you... I'm approximately where I should be, so let's no, leave this it here. perfect. Um, See, and I'm adjusting okay. here. So, war well, of the next. Please okay. do set up. Um, yeah. 
Well, a brief introduction, as you said, it's 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 kind of a far future artificial world. It's actually built around the remains of our sun. It was so far in the future, billions of years in the future, that the sun has collapsed into a white dwarf, which is what happens to all uh, ordinary mainstream stars in the end of sufficient size. And uh, around that, some rather inefficient, not very good gods, the last of huma the, the humanity's descendants have built a kind of Disneyland so they could spend some nostalgia uh, um, of the flesh for a few years before uh, zooming off somewhere else. And all the inhabitants are sort of creations that have been left behind. Um, and so we're several generations down the line from that and the world is beginning to fall apart. And Chris said something about black and white uh, mora uh, morality meeting the complexity of the world or maybe the complexity of morality meeting black and white world. The problem that Lustor has is that he translates the complexity of the world into rather black and white morality. So that's his problem throughout the book. But we'll and just the start... Lucider, I think just, we'll start uh, uh, Sorry to jump in yeah. here. The Lucider is your your hero. Is the the Clint Eastwood uh, the the yeah. roaming those lands? He's a lands. classic anti-hero. He's an anti-hero. Yeah. He's the guy who does the uh, um, wrong things for the right reason, as opposed to the right things for the wrong reason. Um, but he's trying to do the right thing by his own lights. Um, and uh, I was we start at the beginning, really, which is uh, kind of in the middle of where uh, the beginning or the middle of the beginning of his journey. Now, I should say I've not read from this before. The book came out four months ago, just before lockdown started in the UK. So not only have I not read it anywhere before, so you're the first people to hear me read this. I've not actually seen a physical copy in the in the shops. Boohoo. Anyway, that's, this is that's a life. this is a first, folks. Did you just so, realize this? This is an exclusive yeah. Second Life exclusive. Hold the presses. Go ahead. <laughs> there we go. So we'll start first chapter, first couple of pages. Of a cha the first chapter is called Ghosts of Godlings. A lone tree leaned over the cistern. Its bell-shaped yellow leaf canopy dinting and swaying in the hot breeze, sprinkling coins of mirror light across the water in the effigy of a toad, carved from a knot of bone white wood, which crouched on a slab of rock at the water's edge. The lucidor picked up the stoneware beaker set between the toad's long toed feet, left by some unknown traveller and used by many such since, and dipped it in the cistern and drank the measure of cool water straight down and refilled it and sat back on his heels, sipping slowly, wondering if the toad was the avatar of a godling or the spirit animal of one of the vagrant tribes that wandered the borderlands, wondering if the bandits knew about this little oasis. Most likely they did. This was their territory, and he was a stranger here, passing through on his way to somewhere else. A school of desert minnows patrolled the cistern's square perimeter, flickering beneath the fleet of narrow, interned leaves adrift on the skin of water, turning about the current of the spring that pulsed from a crack beneath the deity of their little map, scattering when the lustral stood and unhooked the fighting staff, slung, slight, slight, slung slight ways at his back and shrugged off his black leather coat. The right side of his face darkly blushed, as if he had sat too long by a fire. His long grey hair, brushed back from his forehead and gathered into a coil pinned by, barrette, by a barrette, was scored by a crisp charcoal streak that ran above his ear and the left sleeve of his shirt had been ripped off and tied around his upper arm. He used his teeth and right hand to undo the knot of this makeshift bandage, and drops of fresh blood welled and ran when he peeled the cloth and the raw trough out in his biceps. Out in the mirror light, the stolen war horse caught the blood scent and stepped about and tugged at the reins that tethered her to a thorn bush. The loose door paid her no mind, refilling the beaker and rinsing out the wound. Pinkish water dripped into the pool and the minnows flicked around and rose to the surface and snapped and fought over this offering. The loose door picked threads of cloth from the wound and washed it again and dabbed it dry. With a small ceramic knife, he cut a strip from the shirt sleeve and folded it into a pad and laid it over the wound and tied the remainder of the sleeve around his arm and blotted sweat from his forehead with the back of his hand. He put the beaker back in its place and pulled on his leather coat and picked up his staff and walked up the Sony Stoke to the crest of the ridge. It was high summer, noon. The eight white points of the sky day mirror arc swung across the crown of the blank blue sky. 
as hot and bright as they ever would be. The tawny plain shimmering in great force of heat and light, stretching towards a chalky sketch of mountain peaks and the border between the Free State and Patua. A minute feather of smoke slanted in the mid distance, warping in the glassy air. The Lusador extracted his spyglass from the flap of his pocket of his coat and shot it to its full length and applied it to his right eye and studied the route of the smoke and the plain on either side. There had been no sign of pursuit when he had forced in his flight across the grasslands to bind his wound, and there were none now, none that he could see. But although the ambush had failed, he knew that he had not yet outrun the hunt. Even if the bandits had fled or had been captured or killed by the train's crew and passengers, the department knew where he was and where he was going and would set other hirelings or agents on his trail. He had to get on and make a new plan as he rode. Okay, so there's the start. And Wonderful, now... Paul. This is the Lucidor, uh, a, a yeah. lawman, uh, and you mentioned here the department doesn't know where he is, and I'm just thinking... <whistles> if... <whistles> exactly. If you sell the film rights, I have some great uh -huh. musical ideas. Please uh, <laughs> call me. Uh, but that's that puts the tone in there and you said something in the beginning which which you realize when you read it which i thought ah where do these worlds come from who created these worlds and the people who populate the world they talk about godlings and they were there at one time and they rode people and then they left and nobody really knows um and uh you never explicitly uh go into detail where these where these worlds sort of came from or these godlings and i mean that's just such a uh, such a wonderful subtle uh choice that you made that you made that that sort of uh infuses this whole thing with 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 uh mystery i guess this makes it well, very the people, i mean the people living there don't actually know much about their creators um some of their ancestors were ridden by the gods so there there are families who are specially picked out because they were they they, they were they were used as uh, as kind of avatars of the gods um, when the gods are having adventures and wars, and there are there are, there are ruins and and old battlefields scattered across this, the uh, various maps. I should say that the world is very very big, um, so each map is basically a planet skinned and stretched out on 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 part of the world, which is mostly ocean, mm -hmm. um, and it's very big because it needs to be at a certain distance from the white dwarf star, which means that on its surface gravity is exactly the same as it is on Earth. Um, uh, so it's, ba it's, it's based on a, a paper that some Spanish physicists put out a few years ago. And I thought, oh, oh they've done all my world, word building for me. How cool. All I have to do is populate it, which is well, what I did. And MAP also refers to uh, the genetic mapping because we encounter yeah, sure. all sorts of genetically modified people. But what, what is interesting, um, and, and you can sit back down, please, Mr. McAuley. Thank you very much. Oh, can uh, I? This is the big question. You can. You can. Uh, <laughs> Yes, we can. Let's the, the American spirit. We can yeah. do this. Um, the uh, what's fascinating here, and what I actually want to do for the uh, for the remainder of the hour before we go into the post game, is uh, actually Chris uh, ask uh, if you would ask Paul what you would like to know from him about craft or maybe this latest book, and then I can just sit back and 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 hear the two masters and absorb the knowledge. Um, and then we go back and forth like this for a little bit. Um, my yeah. final qu question for Paul real quick uh, about these these godlings or where these worlds come from. When I was reading this book, this is fascinating to me because I I thought like you I thought, OK, Paul will sort of reveal at the end or somewhere in the last quarter who made these worlds and he will. Uh, peel back the curtain and boom. Uh, and uh, spoiler alert, I, I maybe I shouldn't spoil it, <laughs> what happens, but um, is there a pressure from uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the editor or the publisher? Um, again, we touched on this earlier. Uh, for you guys, and this uh, applies to Chris as well, to hit certain, certain points that you need to hit, like at... Um, which is very um, normal in in Hollywood, and I scored a bunch of uh, bigger films, and it was it was the same thing where 
the music supervisor said, well, here you got to bring up the violins because people are crying. And so the, so that these, these um, uh, dramatic points, did somebody at any point say, well, wait, well, you, you know, you got to reveal where these godlings, who these godlings are, who created these worlds. And you said, no, I don't. Or how do these conversations happen is, I guess, my question. Uh, sometimes, I mean, in in the other novel we're going to, we're going to talk about Austral, there was a slight discussion about whether or not I was going to, I was going to put a date on when it was happening. Uh, and I always think that's that's fatal when you're dealing with. Uh, I mean, Austral is 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 a century and a bit ahead of its time, so it's nearish future as opposed to billions of years, which is uh, basically fancy future. Um, and I said, I said, I'd rather not actually um and it was the same with uh, into everywhere and uh, something coming through which happened in what i call the extended present in other words it's it's a it's it, there's no date on it it's just it's just the present happening world whatever whatever you want to take that because you say as soon as you say it i said it actually happens a year in the past whenever the reader is reading it um so it's a kind of slightly alternative world which because as soon as you put a date in, and I've done this in novels, um, foolishly, um, you, you're kind of a hostage to fortune. And oh, yeah, all futures date, but I don't want to, them to have a specific sell-by date. Uh, right. Rather, <laughs> them sort of die a natural death, as it were. You know. Right. Yeah, I, I I feel the same way about it. I mean, I think I think I like to be sort of temporally evasive for the exact same reason. Um, there are conversations like that, Drax, with editors about how much you spell things out for the reader versus how much you hold back. I tend to be of the view that um, uh, the most enjoyable reads come from things where a lot of the information is in the negative space of the narrative, if you will. It's kind of yeah. off the page and people are allowed to kind of People are smart and they're allowed to do the work of kind of putting it together themselves and maybe bringing some of their own experience to it and having their own experience of the text. But like to, to Paul's point about time, I mean, uh, these books that I've done in the past three, four years, Tropic of Kansas, Rule of Capture and Failed State, they're not really, in my mind, set in the future. They're set in a sort of weird mirror version of the present as I was writing them. And um, and in some respects, they feel futuristic, but everything about them are all things that uh, large. Well, less so with failed state, which is a little more uh, overtly futuristic and imagining kind of what could come uh, after a breakdown. But uh, uh, I think that that's fun to kind of have some uncertainty about, you know, just when this is taking place yeah. or just exactly what's going on. And, no, absolutely. Um, and in the case of your books, Chris, it also feels what just occurred to me. It's also uh, at the, the, it, it also depicts a time that is the result of of certain actions. You know, it's like veering in in a parallel universe, if you will, if we continue on this track, but we don't have to. And you're showing us that in in this uh, black mirrorish fashion, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 thing, it's, it's like, like a, a carry on, Paul, please. Yeah. Oh, both, no, both, please. Both. After you. Um, I'll go first because I was going to talk about your books actually, Chris, because they are actually quite fractally, fractally dense, but they're also from the point of view of the character. So the stuff he experiences is the way, the way we learn about his world is how he experiences it and that what he thinks about it, and because he's kind of a somewhat sarcastic character. Um, we learn, you know, that we learn things from a slant. He's always examining, looking under the surface of things, which is a cool way of, of doing world building. And there is a world building problem in that people people want you to explain everything. Sometimes your editors some uh, uh, want you to explain every corner, and you're like, no, I want to leave some stuff for the readers to discover, um, and I want to know stuff about the world that the readers don't know, and that I'm not going to put in, but it informs the way i look at the world and my characters look at the world so that's that's right that's i mean as well it's kind of the hemingway principle of always leaving something yeah. significant out in the story yeah i mean rule of capture right the the world building element there is i didn't i didn't have to do any research on white dwarfs but i had to <laughs> imagine an entirely alternative legal system one that would exist in a truly dystopian usa and so I just went to the law library and basically researched it. But you don't need to have a 
you know, an appendix that spells all of that out for the reader. You want just enough that they can kind of follow what's going on. Mm. I'm not so sure, Chris, because I told my wife a little bit what was going on. And she said, that's exactly, that's the real life of a public defender. There's right. nothing, there's nothing uh, fantastical about it. Well, that's the idea. You want to totally ground it in the material of the observed world. And it, it sort of raises my question for, for Paul, which is, um, you talk about, right, I mean, these challenges of voice and of how you convey world building in science fiction through the point of view of a particular character. And with these uh, uh, Donnie Chemo novels, it's easier because he's a smart ass lawyer and he can kind of, uh, through his point of view, he reveals a lot. He understands the world pretty well. Tropic of Kansas is mainly told from the point of view of basically a homeless teenager who has very little understanding of the world and it, and it, and it provides for a more kind of uh, fragmented narrative. You do this amazing job in Austral of, um, of that kind of near future point of view through uh, 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 a character who has a very particular experience of that world and through her story, you really get a good sense of it. But like with maps, more of the maps, when you're writing something that far in the future, in that sort of alien, that hard science fiction of a world, it's so hard science fiction that it's like feels like fantasy. How do you go about the the challenging, the, the fundamental novelistic act of like finding the voice of the book in a way that's going to work? Um, I, th I think basically by trying to aim at a certain degree of alienation. Um, I mean, the character has it because he's in a different country, which... Um, he doesn't quite understand the rule. I mean, he knows the rules, but he doesn't quite understand the, the, the depth of the rules by which the country goes by. Um, he has a bunch of encounters with strangers, actually most of them women. I mean, one of the points of the, of the book is that he's, he's, a, he's, he's a male character with typical male energy, but um, slowly as he goes through the encounters with different women. He slowly, he's, he should realize, oh, and I'm not sure if he does, because he's a very recalcitrant character, but he's, he's, he's taught different ways of thinking by various women who, who in the end end up being more powerful in the story than he is. Um, at the beginning, he's like a hero riding into town, saving some people in trouble from uh, basically bandits who've taken over their island. And then towards the end, he's dependent totally on uh, a woman he randomly encountered near the beginning. Um, so, so the way through the basic was really doing the obvious thing of seeing, seeing this strange world through his eyes. Uh, he's seeing the, uh, he's seeing the country he rides through and see comparing it with his uh, desert country. And you, if you've got a desert country, that's kind of easy to do because everybody knows basically what a desert is like. It's, um, so, so you can, so I've got a kind of grounding there of familiarity, but then you just do little tricks of um, things which seem normal, but which then turn out not to be normal at all. Like the war horse is actually armored with natural armor and it's um, partly carnivorous. We find awesome. out a little, I didn't, I didn't carry on later on with a little reading, but it's, it, I was digging for insects at the beginning. They chose to bite him and later on he eats a lizard and so on. Um, and uh, he, he, he eats scraps of a snake, the um, loose door throws to it, et cetera, et cetera, in the first characters, first couple of chapters. So the idea is to keep the reader slightly off balance at all times, which I, is what I, I like about science fiction, is that you should be slightly off balance. The world should be a little bit disturbing. It shouldn't be cosy because it's a different world. It's, and you're a tourist in it, basically, as a reader, and you're, trying, you're finding out about it as you go along. So when you say, you know, the reader should be doing work, Chris, I absolutely agree. You know, as a reader, you're obviously putting stuff, readers are putting stuff into books um, when they're reading it. It's, it's a mental exercise. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and uh, I hope I'm 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 uh, giving the reader space to um, flex her mind, you know. Well, and by that idea of turning of, of the point of view character being a traveler, uh, a visitor to a, a, a an alien landscape, in the way in this particular context that you kind of tap into the bones of the western or of the traveler story, that's a pretty cool solution to achieve that kind of. It's a slow burning sense of wonder as you kind of move through the page. 
Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's just uh, basically stealing the whole Lone Rider concept from Clint Eastwood movies and spaghetti westerns. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I remember they should be called Italian westerns, uh, according to Enrico. Well, it's funny because uh, yeah. I did the same thing with Failed State, which is partly about it's this Yojimbo narrative or the, the mm -hmm. for a few dollars more narrative about the person who's kind of like switching between the different factions in a kind of a wasted landscape. And I don't know, I think those stories provide kind of infinite material. Um, yeah, and there's also there's also a kind of Japanese influence in, in the character of the Lucidor as well. He, he carries the stick for mm -hmm. a reason because it goes back towards the samurai thing. And a lot of the Westerns, as you say, um, um, are the bones of their um, plots from um, Japanese samurai bombs, the big, the big tradition in the, in the 50s and 60s, the post-war Japan, 50s and 60s, the, the samurai Edo, is it the Edo period, I think? Yeah. Yeah. Um, of when, when samurais were cast, cast loose from their masters and were wandering the land looking for stuff to do and getting into trouble or causing trouble. Although um, a lot that was of... ideal kind of fodder for Western plots. But I think yeah, so there's and, a flavor of that in the book too. It's awesome. Well, and in turn, I think a lot of the story, some of the samurai stories in turn were borrowing from at least Kurosawa from like uh, American noir or, or, or yeah. kind of pulp detective novels. Like I guess Yojimbo, Kurosawa was playing heavily on Red Harvest, the uh, uh, Hammett novel, which is about a yeah, detective Kuros who goes in. Kurosawa, into... yeah, sorry. No, yeah, go ahead. Kurosawa did, did a lot of. Uh, Films uh, uh, apart from the samurai ones. I mean, he did he did an adaptation of an Egbert Bain novel, actually. Um, uh, the film High and Low. I can't remember which McBain, eighty seventh precinct it's based on, but uh, it, it's based on an, on an Egbert Bain novel. So yeah, he's certainly got a noir background as well, and there was certainly a good mm -hmm. strain of of noir stuff in the fifties, which then became in the seventies became this kind of technicolor. 70s and 80s actually became this kind of technicolor gangster, over the top gangster stuff that we still see in, in some Japanese films today. Um, this is the best no. book club ever. I just have to sit here and listen to you guys. This is very, very enjoyable. If I, it just occurred to me, and we're running up against the clock, but I was told by my producers uh, that we can go over uh, a little bit. What fascinates me is actually that Paul is seems to be writing. Uh, Paul, what's your relationship with, with American culture? Uh, well, I lived in the States for two years in LA, so a, ah. kind, of, a kind of baffled <laughs> sense of uh, sort of understanding it. But then the, you get down into the, in, into the uh, long grass and you suddenly find out that, no, you're completely lost in it. It's completely alien culture that just happens to share a language and uh, a common cultural Part of I mean, route. you know, I'm so not an expert a, at, at, at all, part. and but I feel that your yeah. tone uh, is it 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 feel it feels American to me vis-a-vis -vis other British writers that I know, just from a reader's perspective, without any mm -hmm. uh, formal training how to dissect these things. Is oh, that deliberate or? Uh, um, it's. I think it's a voice thing. Actually, I don't think. I don't think Australia is particularly American, to be honest. Um, and a couple of other Fairyland isn't isn't especially American either. Um, maybe War of the Maps is a bit because of the Western thing, and the and also the big landscapes that we had, that, that, that the novel has too. So yeah, I uh, think it's, it's the just setting, a question of yeah. tone, and, and, and uh, uh, the, the, I mean the the uh, characters have a voice. And the narrative has a tone, and I think it's just a question of tone in the narrative that maybe is picking up. As I said, the the, the sort of go-to place for the inspiration for everything that happens in War of the Maps are all those Clint Eastwood, all those westerns, so uh, and sort of deconstructions of westerns that happen later on as well, like Lone Star and Dove and things like that. So, um, so yeah, maybe not surprising. There's some some American in there. I, I should say wow. that, yes, I actually only read two uh, books of your gigantic yeah. oeuvre, so uh, I cannot <laughs> really evaluate the, the, the range of tones. Um, Chris, the, the, I, I have so, much, uh, qu so many questions here on my run sheet, especially in terms of uh, a climate fiction in Austral, which I just finished this morning, uh, really superb. The, the, I, I guess this falls under the um, genre of climate fiction, uh, but uh, Chris and Tropic. I mean, is 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 Tropic also climate fiction? What, what? what yeah, does it, it, does it, it matter? This yeah, genre? 
classification? I mean, well, I, I I had this kind of well, writing Tropic of Kansas. I set out to write a story that would the the kind of political counterfactual of which was to wonder, you know, what could a more authentically participatory American or any democracy look like? It was about a political revolution. Um, and as I worked on it, and it, part of the setting was to imagine, you know, well, under what circumstances could you really have a bona fide uprising in the U.S.? Things would have to be a lot worse. So I took the the kind of landscape of middle America, the kind of agricultural landscape and dialed up some of its already extant dystopian qualities and set the characters on a kind of, uh, 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 to, to Paul's point about the point of view character as a traveler on a, on, a, on a journey through there where the main character is at the beginning of the novel deported uh, back to the US from a, a Canadian border that's been walled in from the other side. Um, but as I went through that, I sort of the characters realized and I realized that a lot of the injustices of the society that they were encountering or had experienced in their lives were really ultimately rooted in the damaged relationship the society and its people had with the land on which they live. And um, that uh, to me, to my mind, you can't really write uh a work of political fiction that really engages just with the, the the root problems without un, without wrestling with climate issues and issues about our kind of unbalanced relationship with the natural world. And so that runs through these three books. It's probably most manifest in Failed State, which is about people trying to really engage in the project of rewilding the the human you know the human shaped Anthropocene world. Uh, in Rule of Capture, it's just about how the legal system embodies those various principles of like theft from the environment and sort of wraps them in a cloak of legitimacy. So I think that stuff's really important. I think that's a really useful tool that science fiction can have. And you see it in Paul's writing as well, because science fiction can take this like much deeper sense of time than a kind of conventional novel set in the conventional consensus reality present and pull in the kind of the deeper, you know, geologic or even cosmic time to bring those issues to the fore in a very different way. Mm -hmm. And Austral uh, also has the rewilding aspect through the uh, through what uh, Paul calls eco poets. They modify plants and animals and re repopulate the, the melting, uh, melting um, ice regions in the Antarctic. Uh, it's fascinating. I'm looking at the clock and I have uh, decided uh, as the executive producer of this program that we're going to uh, wrap it. But we have a post game where we hang out here in Second Life and we do have a few seats left so people can actually teleport in if they're watching on uh, Facebook and uh, YouTube and hang out for another 30 minutes or so. And they can hang out forever. But Paul and uh, and Christopher will be here um, for another 30, and we'll, we'll, we will do some more reading from Austral and from uh, Rule of Capture. It, in closing, um, there's one question I kind of, I guess we answered this from Dreams Fear here. How does it feel as an author to set a time frame for your book and then watch time come catch up to the timeline of the book? I mean, I guess that's how we started. You just look at Portland in terms of Chris's uh, world building of of uh, state violence um, against. It's really country. disturbing. I mean, the experience of like, you try to imagine like your worst scenario. I mean, there are scenes in Tropic of Kansas where it's like straight out of that Lafayette Square uh, incident where you have essentially peaceful but rowdy protesters outside of a like militarily barricaded White House being, you know, taken out by uh scary looking, you know, Darth Vader looking paramilitaries. And um, uh, and on the one hand, you know, you sort of dig into it at a level and it, it's sort of not as authentically dystopian as, as it is in the book. And if you look in history, there are lots of much scarier periods of time, but it's a, it's a, it's a disturbing thing, even if it also makes you feel like you've done your job right of trying to, trying to kind of bring out the imminent futures that are already here uh, uh, 
hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. There's a question here uh, from Stella. Do either author feel that only an anti-hero can succeed in saving the future world? Now, there's a trope. The anti-hero. Is that the go-to thing? Uh, for well, anti-heroes anti, anti are interesting because they do... They get into trouble, basically, and getting into trouble is always a cool thing in a, in a genre novel. Um, but uh, in the real world, I think we actually need proper heroes, and generally they're they're usually in the back room. I mean, the, at the moment in 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 Britain, we're having terrible trouble with COVID. The politicians have really messed up um, trying to control it. Not as bad in, in a, as in America and Brazil, but um, proportionately pretty bad. Yeah, at the same time, we have um, very good scientists who've come up, come up with the Oxford vaccine, which you may or may not have heard of, but it's one of the leading candidates for um, a vaccine against COVID-19. So you've got people working away there. They, 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 these, this is a heroic act, you know, mm -hmm. and, and just people coming forward to um, become the human subjects of vaccine trials, you know, for an unknown vaccine for a disease that didn't infect humans a, a year ago. Again, that's a heroic act. Mm -hmm. um, so you find, you know, you find heroism in, in, in small concentrated acts rather than in large gestures sometimes. Just the anti-heroes tend to tear things up and smash things. And as I said, that's always kind of interesting. Yeah, well, and doing the right thing or making a personal sacrifice in the interest of the greater good or just to help others out is a choice. And if you start mm -hmm. with a character who's got some moral ambiguity to them of the possibility that they could make the other choice, the self-interest yeah. choice, it makes for a more interesting story, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it has, it has an intention that you're not going to get if you know the character is going to be good all the way through. And is and basically a novel with a Dalai Lama's hero is 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 kind of difficult to get any attention. It'd still be interesting, but not from the that point of view. That would be very The kind of novels that genre novels tend to be. Uh, I yeah. mean, a novel about somebody in lockdown for three months is, well, actually, you know, science fiction has dealt with that. It's a very Ballardian kind of thing, actually. You know, J.G. Ballard has written things yeah. like the, the Enormous Spaceship about somebody in isolation who just hallucinates a space bigger and bigger inside the very small space they're trapped in. Or the um, the one about the uh, overpopulated world in which somebody finds uh, where everybody's got about um, 10 square feet of space, or if I translate that into European, about um, two square meters of personal space. You know, somebody discovers a room within a room, you know, an unused room. And uh, spoiler, but Bal it's a very old story. A spoiler, say... but it's a very old story is that they fill up that room very quickly as he invites all his friends to experience the the enormity of being able to stretch your arms out without touching another human being and to spin around and to walk up and down more than ten pace, you know, ten paces in a straight line without having to get out of the way of somebody. Um, and soon enough, they spoiled that as well. So it's also a kind of an Anthropocene fable, I guess, too. As Chris was saying earlier on, you know, the way that we tend to mess things up is the story of the Anthropocene. So uh, if you look at if you look at Ballard, he's very prescient about this. So, you know, I could talk about Ballard and the Anthropocene noir. And look at Concrete Island as well, you know, about this kind of idea that um, three people trapped on a traffic island can't get out. Um, it, in in you know somewhere in London and can't get out for various reasons and 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 they set up this kind of Lord of the Flies tribal thing as well. Mm. It's very cutting on human behaviour, which Ballard experienced at first hand the extremes of human behaviour when he was a prisoner of war in Japan in I, in, I in think, China. He was a prisoner of war in China. I, I, I think Japanese all and... needs to come back when Simon yeah. Sellers comes, who of course wrote Applied Ballardianism. Uh, which is absolutely exquisite. Yeah, yeah, and. and, 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 and I, yeah. Both of you guys have to come back when Simon, he has, uh, I'm, ta I'm talking with Simon on and off and I, I hope we can nail down a date. Uh, also, High Rise comes to mind, but now I digress and now I'm getting uh, scolded here by the producers because we're 10, <laughs> uh, 10 minutes past the hour. Um, oh, geez. No, no, this is this is wonderful. And we'll continue the conversation in world just, uh, you know, for the for the VIP folks. Right here in world, the, the the thousands of people who chose to watch this on Facebook and not come in world, they are S H I T out of luck, as they say. See, I didn't even swear. Um, this was a wonderful discussion. Uh, Paul McAuley and Christopher Brown, thank you so much. And I want to end uh, 
briefly here with our segment, What Am I Reading? I'm currently reading and I'm holding the book in my hand, a book by Michael Brooks, and it's called Against the Web. And Michael Brooks was a journalist, a political commentator uh, on the Majority Report podcast, and he passed away this past Monday at the age of 37. Uh, Michael Brooks was an amazing, inspiring person. His his uh, segments on international politics, social movements, the impact, the history of social movements on his own podcast, The Michael Brooks Show, absolutely amazing. This book is 90 pages long, and it talks about the very concerted effort of the so-called new right uh, to grab people through um, online uh, shows and to, to basically grab young uh, directionless men uh, and funnel them into a, a very, very dangerous right-wing um, movement. Um, and I recommend this book to anyone. And I also wanted to say rest in peace, Michael Brooks. Uh, it's, it's devastating for this community to have someone like a sharp thinker like this uh, pass away at the age of 37. I always joked about, you know, I'm, I'm 15 years older than, than he was uh, almost uh, 13 years. And I said, when, when, I, when I grew up, I want to be like Michael Brooks. But uh, this, is, uh, this is the show uh, for today, the Second Life Book Club. We return next week at the 12 o'clock hour with Primi Mohammed with her amazing Beneath the Rising. Yes, Michael Jamal Brooks thoroughly says it here. Um, uh, yes, rest in peace, Michael. Next week, Premi Mohammed, Beneath the Rising, uh, again, sort of in the Lovecraftian realm of things, I guess. And we also will announce a very, very special Lovecraftian uh, uh, event that we're booking right now. I can't talk anymore about this, but please watch the official Second Life Twitter and Facebook feeds. The reading list is at bookshop.org slash shop slash track to reads, or you just click on any of the books that are lying around here. And you'll find link to uh, Paul's website, to Chris's website, and to all the books. And uh, we're going to go into our post-game hangout here in, uh, at the venue and continue the conversation for another 20 minutes or so. Thank My you, Drag. Thanks for everybody who showed up. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Paul. See you all next Wednesday at 12 o'clock right here at the Second Life Book Club.